any sort of attempt to discuss it can be framed as anti-Semitic. And so you have to contend with the fact that no matter what you do, any sort of Palestinian solidarity movement is going to be accused of that by certain groups. Um, and that is just kind of seemingly part of the game right now and has been for a long time. Um, I was just, I'm just thinking of like some of the more unhinged takes on social media coming from um, various like Jewish influencers or like Jewish actors in particular or comedians in particular that are very, um, you know, any, any sort of criticism of what's happening is viewed as being like, well, you don't, you don't value Jewish lives then. Right. So there is going to be a lot of this, um, <clears throat> I guess I'm kind of rambling here, but there is just just general sense that any sort of speaking up about this is going to be met with accusations. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, it, it's, it's just, I just wanted to speak to that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the, I think one of the comfortable truths about this is that an anti-Semitic take on a global situation is also an untrue one. So it's functionally mm -hmm. not helpful, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think let's take like the Israel lobby thesis, which I think is what like you were sort of introducing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not like so brash to say that people talking about the Israel lobby are all anti-Semites. There are mm -hmm. anti-Semitic versions of this I've heard. There's others that mm -hmm. I think are kind of simplistic, mm -hmm. maybe get some things wrong. And there's other versions that I've heard that seem you know, reasonable. Um, but the assumption being is that there's this coalition of largely Jewish groups that sort of control U.S. foreign policy. And in the kind of first incarnation of that discussion, it's specifically that it's sort of malevolent for Jewish or for um, American national interests or something. Right. Mm -hmm. And I I, I think this and there's a lot of Palestinian writers that have talked about why this is insufficient. But in reality is that I think kind of gets this backwards. The reality is, is that. Um, Israeli nationalism is incredibly important for, for example, American defense contractors, mm -hmm. uh, for American hegemony, Western hegemony in general in the region. Um, and so the idea that sort of like the tail wagging the dog in this case, I think just misunderstands how systems of power work fundamentally. Mm -hmm. And this becomes a problem because it does what a lot of theories like this do all the time is exceptionalize something that's actually a systemic problem. It's not these Israel lobby groups that are the problem here. It's capitalism and global mm -hmm. imperialism in the in the West's hegemony in the world, right? Those are the actually part of the system. And so if you want to actually address that, you need to kind of go to the top in that way and build, you know, organizing strategies and ideas and stuff that are able to address that both the immediate needs and then kind of address the global systems that are at play in it. So I think what I think one of the problems that's up happening is that you have opportunistic claims of anti-Semitism and people sort of like back away from you and thinking about the issue at that point, because, mm -hmm. um, because they're going to be called anti-Semitic no matter what. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen this happen on college campuses where it's just like the second a Palestinian student says anything, they're accused of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and this is also, for example, what's happened with the way that the BDS movement was slandered. That's the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. Um, to pressure Israel, essentially a nonviolent movement called by Palestinians to pressure is to press Israel to change behavior by boycotting some Israeli goods and having divestment from Israeli institutions and financial arrangements and and pushing for sanctions. You know, this is often labeled as anti-Semitic, usually pointing to the boycott specifically and saying like, well, Jewish goods have been boycotted before. And certainly, again, like I've seen people do these boycotts in really atrocious ways before, you know, I've written mm -hmm. about this and stuff. But to call this foundationally anti-Semitic, a nonviolent movement to literally try and kind of push for civil rights and autonomy in Palestine is sort of absurd. And it makes the case that you no longer have to take claims of anti-Semitism seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and that's created a really big problem because when those things actually do show up, people are pretty much on their defenses about it for understandable reasons, you know? So, and this does happen. And it's, it, I think it's also, it's overblown and the right is going to use this opportunistically, but it does happen. For example, they the national justice party, the NJP, which is a white nationalist political party. They showed up near 
the one of the Washington DC Palestine rallies and you know held signs that say you know no more Jewish wars and stuff like that mm -hmm. other people have shown up at, at Palestine demos they're almost roundly kicked out you know if someone's mm -hmm. involved in Palestine organizing they're probably also an anti-fascist and they probably have a pretty good head about this stuff yeah so it's not like they're just like making their way uncontested or something but having a good radar for how it works and how to see that stuff I think is important and when we're having sort of like these large organizations make accusations of anti-Semitism that don't make any sense, it makes it really difficult to parse those things out and create sort of consensus about what to do about it. Mm. Uh, and I think we're seeing this really acutely actually right now, um, where like there's organizations that are like taking out uh, basically like trucks, like rental trucks and putting student information for students that signed you know a letter in support of palestine and driving it around or doxing them sharing their information contacting mm. their future employers basically really decimating the lives of students mm. a lot of this is in response to various kind of embarrassing statements that were put out or things that were ill-timed um mm. or or people sort of like um six degrees of separation from someone who did say something problematic mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. it's a sort of confusing mess like that and yeah. so that's again creating this climate of fear that's not going to reconcile for people to actually address the issues that are important yeah i was thinking of the various tactics that are being because I, I mean i've heard of people in um university positions that are being pressured to not say anything for fear of losing their jobs or you know, other ways that, um, yes, yeah, students are being pressured or kind of bullied into not saying anything or being bullied after the fact of saying or, you know, signing a letter or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, there certainly is a lot of tactics um, deployed. And I, I this, sorry, I just, I, this is a bit of a, a, a wide ranging thing, but I was also thinking, I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but speaking of this sort of differentiation between anti Semitism and, and Zionism or, or anti Zionism, you mentioned, I think, in the first part of our discussion, how people can be very pro-Zion or like be Zionists, but be anti-Semitic. And in one, I was just reading an article, it was in The Nation recently about some recent things that um, <clears throat> he's a pastor in Texas, I believe, Hagee, yeah. uh, a Christian dominionist type, talking about the this uh, conflict, the the you know this incursion into Gaza and this sort of conflict. As being, you know, this sort of indication that we are approaching the end of days, Armageddon, the apocalypse, et cetera, within, you know, the kind of framing of like kind of Christian apocalyptic, you know, revelations type stuff. Um, and I was thinking like there's a lot of very, you know, these kind of Christian nationalist, Christian dominionist types in the U.S. who do have political power or political influence and are very pro-Israel. Um, but really, it's actually quite anti-Semitic because the point is not about like Jews having a homeland to stay safe. It's more like this is part of the larger plan for Christ to come back again. And if I remember correctly, it's been a long time since I was, you know, I, I grew up uh, kind of believing this stuff. But like, I don't think that it works out very well for the Jews in the end. I think it's actually pretty fucked up what happens. Yeah. Um, so... There's this weird tension or this relationship where the, you know, yeah, the state of Israel itself and maybe the underlying ideology of Zionism does not seemingly align with some of the most ardent supporters of the state of Israel in the United States um, and maybe in some other places as well. But I mean, I just think that this is a good example of how that is a pretty anti-Semitic relationship. And yet, you know. The state of Israel, as it were, the officials that that govern it uh, are pretty okay with it. It's kind mm -hmm. of it's an it's an interesting dynamic. So, I think that's just another level of the complexity here. Yeah, I, I think so. So, ha Pastor Haggy, who, who you're talking about, yeah. uh, runs Christians United for Israel. So, if we're going to talk mm -hmm. about Israeli lobby groups, that's the largest in the U.S. It's mm -hmm. not a Jewish group, right? Mm -hmm. Like this, and they have a very specific eschatological reason for that. So, in the narrative that they've built and this is really deep and i think american evangelicism you know the left behind series other other basically mm -hmm. like not just popular culture but their entire kind of worldview is built on this sort of vision of how end times play out and it's based on essentially jews reclaiming israel moving to israel ensuring it's sort of um, jewish hegemony in some cases rebuilding the temple 
And then it ends with the vast majority of them experiencing genocide. Um, uh, so yeah, I think, you know, 80, 90, or 90, 95% of them are sort of um, killed in whatever kind of version of the narrative that's being told. The ones that aren't killed are forced to convert. So, and I think what's really important about this forced conversion is that this is actually historically what anti-Semitism demanded of Jews, right? Mm. The kind of racial anti-Semitism or ethnic anti-Semitism was more of a later modern invention. It really was conversion at the point of death for centuries. Um, and then that slowly kind of became not enough. Um, and so what's being demanded here is that Jews are allowed to survive, but only if they cease to be Jews, right? So if they give up anything that uh, gives them distinction and they break their own continuity, you know, Jewish safety depends on Jewish continuity, basically the ability of Jews to reproduce Jews. So like, you know, to have Jewish traditions remain and to have a community that is able to be distinct. So this kind of support for Jewish autonomy and safety really is about Jews being able to build communities that reflect themselves and to continue their traditions and folk ways and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But this does not see Jews in that way. Instead, they say, and they will celebrate Jews you know, at their conferences. Sometimes they'll you know, use Jewish ritual items out of context. I've been at Christian nationalist rallies where people blow the shofar, which oh, you know, yeah. we only blow on specific days, but they're just kind of blowing it at random. Mm -hmm. um, they'll talk a lot about the Jewish origins of Christianity and the Jewish connection to Christianity. Um, and they'll talk about, you know, we're, we're going to be putting up for Jews. No more genocide of Jews. The Holocaust never again. They'll kind of repeat a lot of these slogans, but their vision of Jews is to use them instrumentally. Mm. Um, so there's a scholar, Sean Durbin, who says that it's essentially a fetish for Jews that happens in these Christian evangelical spaces where they project other sorts of needs and ideas and meaning onto Jews. Mm. And again, if we're talking about anti-Semitism, this is how Jews have been related to forever. The scholar David Nuremberg talks about how the, the narrative applied to Jews says more about the communities that the Jews aren't in than it does the Jews themselves. They're mm -hmm. basically mobilized so that people can create boundaries in their communities or they can establish identity politics or reinforce their own values, but it has very little to do with actual Jews. And so what's happening in amongst Christian Zionists, is again, Jews are being placed into this opportunistic role where they are being pushed to do certain things. And this actually happens too, in, in all reality, because you know Christian Zionism is so influential, including in Israeli policy, they actually push for a very particular type of Zionism, mm -hmm. uh, particularly presence in the West Bank. Remember that uh, the language that they use is that's Judea and Samaria, and the hills of Samaria are supposed to be grapes that are grown as promised in Torah, right? So like mm. they want to reclaim the Jewish kind of right to grow these grapes in Samaria. So you have these bizarre situations in which Christians will volunteer in mass to come to the West Bank and um, work for free on vineyards run by Orthodox Jews. Like it's a very strange setup that ends up happening, mm. but it's all done because they see Jews as playing this out. And I think like you're saying, there are certain people either in Israel, sometimes in the U.S., in pro-Israel consensus politics that sees this as a sum good that says, well, this is empowering Israel. And in their vision of Jewish safety, Israeli nationalism is the centerpiece, right? Like they believe that that is what keeps Jews safe. So even if these people are anti-Semitic, they are helping us to empower the one thing that will keep us safe. And this is part of the problem of the vision we have of anti-Semitism is that it sort of understands anything that someone deems threatening to Jews or a Jewish person as categorical mm -hmm. anti-Semitism. And so in this case, these folks are not presenting a threat to Jews, right? Because they're empowering the defense mechanism of the Jews, the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, like, as we've talked about, I don't think that the Jewish state is a very great way to keep Jews safe. And I don't think it's mm -hmm. proving to keep Jews safe. Yeah. But that's sort of the, the narrative framework for it. So it ends up creating a problem whereby, you know, Jewish you know, critics of Israel are called anti-Semites. And then someone like Pat Robertson is, you know, who has openly anti-Semitic conspiracy theories in his books and, and sort of celebrates the coming uh, forced conversion and genocide of Jews. He's celebrated as a friend of the Jews instead. So it's a bizarre mix up. I'll say there's an even added level of complexity here where I'm seeing um, sort of like people in the Israeli right Jewish Israelis even use anti-Semitic conspiracy theories as a way of attacking critics of Israel, you know? Mm. 
saying they're funded by Soros and things like that. So we're talking about this kind of strange infrastructure that I think uses anti-Semitism or misunderstandings of anti-Semitism to create their entire infrastructure of argument. Mm-hmm.